Oh, wait, no, I talked about this game, right? This Yeah, this game was in the video, wasn't it? But it got released here under a different name that now I can't remember. Shoot. B-G-Q plus. All right, so this is a video that I really intended to make quite a long time ago. Uh, if you'll recall when I did the Nintendo 64 launch video, uh, sometime right after that, I made like a, a post-game video and put it on this channel. And uh, at the time, I thought it was a really cool idea. And so I, you know, I meant to do it with the Dreamcast video, but then I ended up just uploading that talk that I gave uh, at that video game convention instead. But when I made the PlayStation in 1995 video, I, I meant to make, like I had this whole thing planned out to make like this, you know, post game video and I just never got around to it until today. So we're gonna do it uh, today. So I was just gonna talk a little bit about, um, you know, my history with the PlayStation, but just really briefly, and uh, and then just sort of talk about making the video again very briefly. And then what I thought we would spend most of the time doing, because I thought it sounded like fun, is doing like a really like super casual magazine uh, flick through, really. I have this issue here. This is issue number one of Dimension PSX, and uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, when when we get there. Only other thing I wanted to say real fast is that uh, I'm trying out this new microphone uh, that I got. Um, not an expensive microphone at all. I mostly thought that maybe it would be cool for uh, doing live streams. It's a dynamic microphone, so that just means that as I back away from the microphone, it gets like way less sensitive. And so I figure that's really good for eliminating background noise. But uh, this is my first time using a dynamic microphone. So if this sounds like crud, uh, then it'll be the last time that I use it in a video. But uh, as far as this video goes, um, this is what we're using. So, um, so as far as the PlayStation goes, uh, the only thing I really wanted to talk about, because uh, that would be more of a topic for like an episode of Flashback whenever I get around to getting back to that. Um, one of the things that interested me about doing a PlayStation in 1995 video is the fact that I didn't have a PlayStation in 1995 or even 1996. At some point, like way back when, somebody asked me, uh, you know, I was doing like a Q&A video back when, you know, I guess people, I feel like people don't do Q&A videos as much anymore, but maybe that's just my perception. But anyway, I did a Q&A video and somebody asked, you know, if you could go back in time and like relive any uh, console launch, which one would it be? And to be honest, I could like name a bunch of different ones uh, that, you know, I, you know, probably most consoles that I didn't get on launch day it would be cool to go back and get on launch day, right? But the one that I believe I mentioned was the PlayStation, just because I, you know, I have a strong memory of that law. I mean, it came out when I was 18, so it's not like I was a kid. And, um, but I didn't get one for a, for a variety of reasons. I just, I wasn't really super into video games in 1995, just because uh, my computer was no longer, you know, up to the task of playing then modern PC games. I still had my Genesis, but that was always sort of a secondary system for me uh, to the to the computer. And uh, as I said in that video, uh, the the Q and A video, really the probably the biggest reason, aside from the fact that I just wasn't interested in video games enough to be like excited about a PlayStation, uh, it is just the cost. And uh, I I went over this in that video, so I'm just going to repeat myself. You know, PlayStation when it came out was $300, and then you still had to buy a game, so that's another $50. Then you had to buy a memory card, that's another 20 bucks. And then, like, in my case, I would have had to buy the RF thing, so that's, like, I don't know, another 10 or 15 bucks. But point is, like, after tax, you're talking about more than $400 at a time when I was basically working a minimum wage job making, like, four fifty an hour. So, uh, that you know, the, the total... Bill, you know, when I went to, you know, if I had gone to wherever to buy a PlayStation and everything I just said would have been more than one entire paycheck. So, um, so I didn't do that, but uh, you know, I remember, uh, you know, that's when I was working at Radio Shack and I remember, 
uh, my coworker, Paul, him and his friends, like, I remember the day the PlayStation came out because they came and like picked him up from work or whatever. And they all went, you know, like they all had PlayStations like pre-ordered. And I remember they were all getting battle arena Toshinden. Cause it's like what they were talking about. Oh, it's like this 3d fighter. And, um, and I, I, I don't, I just don't really have a strong memory of being like, Oh man, I wish I could get that. I was just like, Oh, you're doing that. Like, that's cool. It's just not something that I, I even really considered. So, um, <clears throat> So anyway, I didn't get a PlayStation until 1997. So, you know, all these games that came out in like 95 and 96, uh, you know, except for like the blockbuster titles, a lot of those are were still sort of like a mystery to me, right? Like when I got my PlayStation, I played games like the first Wipeout or uh, uh, Resident Evil. Uh, I'm sure there are a couple others. I just don't remember off the top of my head. But um, uh, Destruction Derby, I had Destruction Derby. But most of these games I didn't have. And in fact, you know, when I had my PlayStation, uh, it was the middle of 97. And so, like, you'd go to the store and I would still see long box games because they were just like older games that they still happen to have for sale. You know, some of the games, if it was a really good game or, or I should say like a popular game, like a, a game that sold well, a lot of those games got re-released in, you know, the normal CD jewel cases. But games that were not as popular, you know, it was still just if you went to the store, they might have the long box. And I just sort of had this thing. It's funny now that, you know, long box games are like sort of, I don't know, sought after is probably too strong of a term. But, you know, people who collect PlayStation, a lot of them like they really want to get long box games, right? Like people will see my picture of, you know, a picture of my long box collection. And that that's like a standout thing on my game shelf somehow. But at the time I had no interest in long box. If I saw a long box game, I didn't want it. Like if, if you gave me a choice, like, Oh, well here's like wipe out in a long box or here is like a greatest hits copy of wipe out that has the ugly green stuff on it, but it's in a jewel case in 1997, I would have taken the greatest hits game just to get it in the normal jewel case so that I could like stick it into the CD organizer that I used to, to house all of my PlayStation games. So, um, but outside of, like I said, outside of like sort of the, the blockbuster titles, I had never played uh, really most of the games, the 1995 games, launch games, you know, and the games that come out, uh, came out subsequently. So it was kind of fun for me to make the video just because, uh, you know, here was a chance to play a bunch of PlayStation games that I had never played before and and that really have a different feel to them, I think. Uh, you know, early PlayStation games, like a lot of them were 3DO uh, ports and a lot of them felt more like, oh, it's a 3DO port or a PC port. And they just had sort of a different feeling, I think. Like the PlayStation, I think, really kind of hit its stride in around 97. And maybe that's, maybe that's why I got it. Um, as far as making the video goes, like, I think I said in the notes of the, of the video, it's the longest video or longest scripted video, at least that, uh, I'd ever made. Uh, it also took a really long time to make. People always ask me like, how many hours does it take to make one of those videos? And the, the answer is simply that I have no idea, but, um, I started really working on it like right before, the whole pandemic thing started, but I had the idea in my head to make the video long before that, May maybe as early as like 2016 or 2017. I remember uh, that my wife and I were on vacation and I was thinking in my head, you know, I want to make like a video about PlayStation games of 1995 because that was when I hopped on eBay and bought my copy of Jumping Flash. So, uh, but then I bought it and then just didn't even work on the video for a long time. But what happened was like in the month before, like, you know, the world kind of went crazy with the whole COVID thing. Uh, my buddy Fabian came up here, uh, like he had to come up here and, and go to like a family function and, um, with his parents, uh, he's, he was, he was a, well, I don't want to say it's, that's his business, but uh, he ended up having to like come up here with his with his parents and go to this family function. And they got like a hotel, but he was like, I don't want to stay with my parents. And uh, so he came over and he, he crashed here, which was really, really cool because, you know, it, it was like the old days all over again, because like Fabian like was 
like Fabian and I were like super tight, like when we had PlayStations, like in the in the late nineties. Cause then like he ended up moving away. It's not like we had a falling out or anything. It was just that like he moved away and then I ended up coming up here to go to college and staying here. And so I, I just, you know, we, we kind of kept in touch. And if I went to like LA or something, I would, you know, go visit him or whatever. Um, but we just we couldn't really hang out anymore like we used to. But so like to me, like Fabian and the PlayStation One are just like, you know, like linked together for all time. And so anyway, when he came up here and and ended up, you know, crashing here, like we spent the entire evening uh, down here in the basement, just like drinking beer and playing all the PlayStation games that we used to play together uh, back then, like sports games and, and stuff like that, and just had so much fun. And that really got me back into the spirit of, you know, playing the original PlayStation and that's when I decided like I'm going to get back to work on on that PlayStation in 1995 video and uh, so that would have been in like March of 2020 and the video didn't come out until November of 2021 so that like on and off I was working on that video for you know something along the lines of a year and a half now obviously uh, I would take breaks and work on other things just because when you make YouTube videos, I think the fun part for me, I mean, it's all fun, but the best part I should say is when you release the video and, you know, the, the people that are, you know, fans of your show or whatever, you know, see a new video is released and they start watching it and, you know, you, you see them leaving comments and stuff and it's like, you know, you're, you're making people happy or whatever. And I, I think that's like the most fulfilling part about YouTube to me that, you know, whether it's this channel or the other channel, like I, I really don't care about like subscriber numbers or viewership numbers. Just the fact that there's people out there that are excited to see a new CGQ or CGQ plus video is like the best part of, of doing all this. But so when you're making a video that takes like forever to make, you know, you don't get to have that moment when you release it. And so it turns into like a little bit more of a drag. And so I would work on the video for a while and then I would take a break and upload, you know, something, something else. Like, uh, you know, I know I uploaded at least one magazine read through on, on the main channel. And then like on this channel, I uploaded like three more magazine read throughs. But like, I also did like the Sega Astro city video, like those next 10 videos, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, my point is just because I was working on that video for a year and a half, just to be clear, I wasn't exclusively working on that video, uh, for a year and a half. This is just water. Um, I don't really know what else to say about the video that we can't talk about while we're looking at this magazine. So this is probably going to be a pretty long video. So I think we should just get started. Uh, uh, only thing I'll say, you know, I bought I bought this magazine specifically really to make this video, but I bought this magazine like two years ago and uh, I did read through it when I got it. But I haven't actually read through it since then. So it's not like I'm seeing it for the first time, but I'm only seeing it for the second time. And the first time was a long time ago. So, uh, you know, this is not going to have the same level of uh, preparation or whatnot as most magazine read throughs do. It's mostly just so I can see games and, and that'll remind me of when I worked on that game, you know, that game segment in the video. And I can talk about the game uh, a little bit. So I'm going to move the microphone a little bit so that I can kind of lean in. And uh, OK, here we go. So uh, so as I said, this is Dimension PSX. And I, I had to laugh when I saw uh, this magazine on on eBay, because I feel like any time, not any time, but pretty often if you call the PlayStation the PSX on, you know, social media or whatever, somebody from like the actually crowd has to try to speak up and say, Oh, it was never called the PSX. The PSX is a, a PS two based DVR. The, I don't know. It just seems like a weird thing to argue about when it's so like wholly untrue. And then somebody shared this, this like picture somebody had made uh, with me where it's like this huge collage that's basically debunking 
the whole argument that nobody ever called it the PSX because like magazines called it the PSX, developers called it the PSX, Sony called it the PSX, people in forums called it the PSX. As I've said before, IGN's PlayStation website was psx.ign.com. So I mean, it's just kind of, to me, it's just funny. Like how can you even, it's like trying to argue that the sky isn't blue or something, but, uh, but whatever. Um, Anyway, so this is called Dimension PSX, but if I'm not mistaken, this magazine, uh, after a few issues or whatever, started to be called PS Extreme. And uh, I believe actually a copy of PS Extreme was the first uh, PlayStation magazine I ever bought. But again, that was in 1997. But uh, I don't remember what the exact, uh, I don't know if it says in here. Oh, yeah, here we go. November of 1995. So so this would, you know, probably have been on newsstands, I would think. Um, maybe not at launch, but not too long after it. You'd think by October if it has a, a November date on it. You see that uh, ESPN Extreme Games is uh, the cover story. And that, of course, was a launch game. Definitely one of the better launch games. I won't say it's the best launch game, but uh, if you had bought a PlayStation at launch, uh, you couldn't really go wrong if you bought uh, ESPN Extreme Games. So, uh, oh, and I, this kind of thing that, you know, I've probably said this before, but, you know, there there is a time when I would have been annoyed by this, but now I just think it's really cool that the magazine has a, a Babbage's price tag on it. It just, uh, you know, tells you something about its history. Uh, so first here, I don't know if I use this, you know, so you'll see like, you'll probably see ads in here that I ended up using in my video, but uh, like this one's just pretty cool, uh, an ad for Road Rash there that it seems to me like I would say that it's sort of stylized uh, after like a concert uh, promo poster, like that you would just see like put up on like, you know, billboards and whatnot around town back then, which seems like maybe it's making a reference to... Um, to the game's grunge soundtrack, which, um, speaking of that, cause I, I, like, I assume that the game's going to get covered in this magazine, but I don't know that for a fact. Um, I mean, first of all, the game's awesome, as I mentioned in the video, but, uh, what, what was kind of, I guess, interesting, certainly not cool. Uh, you know, the game has this awesome soundtrack. It's like mostly Soundgarden and, uh, it's got some other stuff like Paw on there, which is a lesser known, uh, grunge era band but like the entire game has you know these songs like it's mostly like if you play the game like i feel like 80 percent of the time you're hearing a sound garden song but i mean it's during the menus and then it's during the gameplay and obviously you can't uh uh have that playing in a youtube video or you're going to get like a copyright claim or a copyright strike which is worse right away and so like i had to mute the audio uh, in the gameplay footage for all of like the menus and whatnot, because then there's no other sound to, to like, at least help cover up the fact that there's licensed music playing. And so I just muted all of it, but then it would sound weird if it's just me talking with just nothing in the background. And so I went and found like royalty free music that was like grunge style and, uh, nobody ever noticed or said anything in the comments. So I guess I must've done an okay job. Uh, over here is uh, the masthead, and I see a couple of names here I recognize. Uh, Tim Linquist over here. I talked about Tim Linquist. I did a read through of uh, Die Hard Game Fan issue number two, and uh, Tim Linquist like helped found that magazine. And even before that, as I explained in that video, uh, he was the one that did like all of the layouts and whatnot for the Die Hard Game Club. Um, uh, sales ads like in the back of EGM and whatnot. So, uh, so there he is as the production director, which makes sense. And then uh, Zach Meston over here. Uh, I mean, I think he he's just a pretty well known uh, author from from back in the day. Um, I, I I more associate Zach Meston with like strategy guides. Like I, I know I have at least a couple of strategy guides that he wrote. But uh, obviously, he also uh, worked in uh, the field of video game journalism. Over here is an ad for WrestleMania, the arcade game. When I know I used this ad in uh, in the video, what a cool game! Like I don't, I'm not sure I'd ever played this game before in the arcade or on the PlayStation before I made the video, and so I didn't really know what to expect. 
and I didn't realize that it was it was so similar to playing something like Mortal Kombat, where it had all the combo moves and whatnot. You know, nothing like the the button mashing style wrestling games that I'm used to, like stuff from like the 8-bit NES. And and I'm not even somebody who is into wrestling like at all. But I mean, this game is just really really good. Uh, here's a feature on uh, on ESPN Extreme Games, and uh, you know, obviously, I already talked about uh, this game in the launch episode. But you know, that launch episode's pretty old, and really, by uh, current standards on my channel, is really not very good. But uh, uh, you know, I think I remember, you know. You know, I was kind of trying to be a little bit more of a porky mouth uh, in that video, which I mean, I I would never go back and watch that PlayStation uh, launch video because it would make me cringe. Um, you know, I remember basically saying that I thought ESP and Extreme Games was like a Road Rash clone, and you know, certainly it takes cues from Road Rash, but it's also a really cool game. So, um, I would have had no problem picking this game up at, at launch if I had bought a PlayStation on on that day. You know, it, it's really just like a combat racing game, you know, like Road Rash, but when you start the game, you can pick, like, if you want to uh, be on, like, a bicycle or rollerblades or um, I think it's a skateboard or then it's, like, some kind of it's, like, not a skateboard because you're laying on it. I don't. It's almost like a luge with wheels. I don't really know. I'm not somebody who's ever watched, like, the ESPN Extreme Games, like the actual Extreme Games. So I don't really know a whole lot about it. Um, so I don't know what that kind of stuff is called. But, uh, but anyway, I mean, it's just a fun game. And they give it a 94%. So obviously they thought it was fun, too. Uh, next is NFL Game Day. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it's pretty surprising to me how they were able to come like straight out of the gate and make such a good football game. And, you know, I'm sure th maybe part of it was they were probably fueled by, you know, a sense of competition with Madden because, you know, while this game was in development, the people working on it were under the impression that Madden 96 was going to get released on the PlayStation. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, that game ended up getting canceled, which if you ever, you know, there's a, a working prototype ROM floating around. So, I mean, you can you can just watch a YouTube video or, or something and see it. I mean, the game looks really, really bad. So I, I'm glad that it got canceled. But I mean, this game day game is is really uh, quite good. I was impressed playing with it. I mean, the graphics look cool. The graphics are still sprite based uh, rather than being polygonal. And it's funny because at the time, like I remember when I got my PlayStation in 97 in uh, it might have been in the first issue of PSM, they did uh like a review, like on one side, it was a review of game day 98. On the other side, it was a review of Madden 98. And, uh, I remember them kind of like talking trash about the idea that a sports game by then would still be using sprites. But it's funny because if you go back now and play it, um, I think a game like this, you know, looks better by, uh, by today's standards. So, uh, for me, this game is still, uh, totally fun to play today. And uh, I guess this is just a preview because it does not have a review score, which kind of makes sense. Over here is a Tekken. Tekken only gets a half a page. And I kind of, so I, I mentioned this in the video, like basically what I said was, um, you know, if, if you bought a PlayStation on launch day, like, I don't know what the tie ratio or whatever is between like the, you know, getting a PlayStation and buying Battle Arena Toshinden, but. I can't imagine too many people were really sticking with Battle Arena once Tekken came out. And of course, at the time, you know, you didn't realize that it was going to be the first game in in like this huge franchise for for the PlayStation. But um, but certainly I think it's better than Battle Arena Toshinden. And I had fun. This is a game like I never really played uh, very much of the first Tekken. So I had fun like recording the gameplay footage. Like I went upstairs and, and found a magazine that I had that it was like a game pro or something that that had like a little 
you know, mini guide inside of it or like a multi-page feature that had like the special moves for all the characters so that I, so I'm sitting there recording gameplay footage and like I have the magazine open in front of me, like trying to learn, you know, some combo moves and whatnot. But, um, but yeah, it was a lot, it was a lot of fun to play. And then this Crime Crackers, I honestly don't know anything about. Uh, I'm not sure that game ever came out here. Certainly it didn't come out in 1995, but uh, I, I don't remember ever hearing about that game. So I'm kind of assuming it didn't come out here. And um, over here is an ad for Warhammer. I've never played Warhammer like on computer or anywhere else. So uh, I really just can't even say anything about it. Uh, High Octane. So that's a game that, I, you know, I think I actually owned a copy. Like I just got rid of some of my long box games, but I, I believe I had High Octane, but had never really spent much time with it. But I had a lot of fun playing it. I mean, it's just it's a futuristic racing game. It's it's in some ways kind of similar to Wipeout and in other ways not. But uh, I had a lot of fun playing it. It's one like there's certain games where I ended up playing them way longer than I needed to just because I was having a good time with it. And uh, and High Octane is one of those games. So, um, yeah, I mean, I would have fun playing that again uh, anytime. But then below it there is uh, Loaded. And uh, I didn't know anything about Loaded like back back in the PlayStation days. I don't, you know, maybe I saw it somewhere and just thought nothing of it. The first time I played Loaded was actually over at my friend Anthony's house. He threw it on and um, I had a really good, I remember sitting there for longer than I needed to uh, playing that game and just having a really good time with it. Just a very dark uh, game. Uh, I don't mean just the graphical style, but just sort of the atmosphere and whatnot. Uh, it's just, you know, it's it's very dark. It's very creepy. Uh, it's very violent, but uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's a cool arcade style game. And then uh, another mind. You know, this is a Mindscape ad, the Warhammer, and then this is just uh, uh, the Raven Project. But I don't. Know, I I kind of get a kick out of looking at this guy. Like this guy just looks very 1995, with you know the button up denim shirt with no collar because like wearing like Henley style, like I had a Henley style shirt, so it didn't have a collar, um, you know, in this corduroy uh, vest. And even like this is one of those Swiss Army watches, like a Wenger watch. Like I had that watch, but I had it with a black uh, band instead of brown. But it just in his hairstyle, like everything here, like I'm not I'm not criticizing him at all. I'm just saying it, it, it you know, he looks very 1995, um, I guess. I don't know. I, I wouldn't address like that, but if somebody else dressed like that, that wouldn't it wouldn't have turned any heads. Like nobody'd be like, "Whoa, why is that guy wearing a corduroy vest?" Over here, uh, Shell Shock. So Shell Shock didn't come out until '96 because I didn't talk about it uh, that I recall in uh, in my video. Somebody left a comment on one of my videos because they were trying to remember the name of a PlayStation game and they described it. And I think it was shell shock and whatever it was, I told him, I'm like, Oh, is it this? And it was, and I think it was shell shock, but, um, I have played a little bit of shell shock. It's pretty fun. I mean, it's like a tank simulator or whatever, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool. And then we already talked about, uh, WWF WrestleMania. And then over here again from Mindscape is an ad for Cyberspeed. These are very strange ads, I have to say. Uh, I don't, anytime an ad doesn't show any kind of like gameplay, uh, like screenshots or anything, I, I just always think that that's so weird. That was something that the TurboGrafx 16 was very guilty of. Assault Rigs. Oh, Assault Rigs. That's another game that, uh, I played that for the first time over at my friend Anthony's house and uh, I really enjoyed like, He really talked it up. I think he had like, he got a PlayStation right when it came out and uh, I think he got assault rigs when it came out. It's sort of like an arcade style, like tank battle game. You know, I don't have any nostalgia for it. Like my friend Anthony does. So I don't think I liked it as much as he did, but I remember like right after he showed it to me, I went, this was like before I had a YouTube channel or anything. Uh, I went up to the Portland Retro Gaming Expo or whatever it's called and was able to buy a copy up there for like five or 10 bucks because this was also before uh, video game prices went crazy. Um, crazy Ivan, I don't really have anything to say about. Uh, DEFCON 5. Um, 
Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't remember thinking too much of DefCon Five. Like it was just, like when I make a video that has that many game segments in it, you can tell how much I like the game or how much I don't like the game by like when I make the segment for it. So like all the games that I didn't really want, that I wasn't excited about or didn't enjoy, like those those segments all got made like last and uh, DEFCON 5 was definitely towards the end. Um, I just really didn't have any fun, uh, you know, playing it and recording gameplay footage. Uh, and kind of speaking to that, uh, the other one here, Offworld Interceptor, or as it was called on the PlayStation, Offworld Interceptor Extreme, also really not that fun and um i don't remember exactly what i said but uh what i would just say now is like you know not worth buying but probably not even like, you know i would have rented this game back in the day and still been disappointed in it so um maybe if i'd had a 3do like you know if i had gotten this game in like 1993 or 1994 on a 3do then i probably would have thought it was a little bit cooler but but yeah uh, oh, and then over here, uh, Road Rash. Again, we just get the half page for uh, Road Rash because it, of course, was not out yet. But um, it's, you know, it's funny. The thing about Road Rash, and I, and I have to actually partially blame, well, not blame, I guess give credit to uh, making that PlayStation in 1995 video, uh, you know, because I was talking about being kind of a smart mouth in the PlayStation launch video. And one of the things that I said that really got a lot of people mad at me is I said that Road Rash was like one of the most overrated games of all time because for the longest time I could not get into the Genesis version, like the original Road Rash. Um, just because, you know, I think it has a, the frame rate's pretty bad and, and the controls really aren't that responsive. But when I finally sat down and really said like, I'm gonna just play a bunch of Road Rash, I was surprised at how quickly uh, I just got over those things. Like I didn't, I didn't mind the frame rate, and I got used to the the way it handles, and I had a lot of fun with it. But it's still not as good as uh, this version. This PlayStation version is really just a port uh, or conversion of uh, the 3DO version. So, like you know, I guess if you have a 3DO, you could play it that way too. Um, but either way, it's just a really, really good game. And, uh, and then down here, uh, Shockwave Assault, uh, you know, that game was like kind of okay. Like I mentioned in the video, I think that it almost seems like the graphics got kind of downgraded from the 3DO and I didn't really understand that, but like I could have rented Shockwave Assault, uh, back then. And I think I would have been okay with it for a weekend or something, uh, unlike Offworld Interceptor, which I would have been done with immediately. Uh, the game is okay, but I don't see how anybody could have bought that and been like super excited about it. Uh, Twisted Metal, that's a game that I forgot to mention sort of at the beginning of the video. Uh, that's a game that I bought when I got, like not right when I got my PlayStation, but you know, not too long afterwards. Because you know, in, in 1997, was it? I think it was in 97. I said it in the video. Uh, they came out with the greatest hits games and, and then, you know, the games were uh, heavily discounted and I had a greatest hits copy of twisted metal. And in fact, that was a game that I remember uh, Fabian and I would play like split screen two player. And um, it's not a great game, but it's a really good game, I guess. Like I liked it enough back then to buy it at a discounted price, but you know, I played it quite a bit for, for that video. I recorded a ton of gameplay footage and, uh, you know, the more I played it, I guess I was kind of expecting to get more out of it. And uh, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't really. So uh, it's good, but not great. And, uh, and then Warhawk down here, that was interesting. It was interesting to me that you could have a game that was so well received by critics and that sold as well as it did, but is just a game that you don't hear anybody talk about uh, anymore. And, uh, like, you know, you expect that with like a sports game, like, oh, how come nobody's talking about, you know, Madden 96 for the Genesis anymore? Like for obvious reasons, but, um, with a game like Warhawk, it's like, you don't ever hear anybody being like, oh man, you know what game I loved back in the early days of the PlayStation is Warhawk, but you don't ever hear anybody saying that, but, um, really fun game. Uh, lots of really cheesy, uh, full motion video cutscenes, but 
Uh, I enjoyed watching them because you just knew, okay, it's going to be cheesy, and then they would say something cheesy, and, and so it was okay. Creel's army keeps popping up all over the place. The last time they showed up, Strike Force Alpha went after them. There wasn't enough of them left to fill a Boy Scout troop. Creel's forces didn't flinch. The game's definitely not easy. I mean, the first couple levels are pretty easy. The, day, the game definitely gets harder. I don't like, like, some of the later levels, like, it shows the screenshot down here where you're, like, sort of, you're flying through tunnels, and it feels more like you're playing Descent. That I don't care for as much. But, like, the first level here where it's sort of like that pyramid, it sort of feels like you're in Egypt or something, it's pretty fun. And then the second level, you're flying, like, through this canyon is, uh, is pretty cool, too. But definitely, in my opinion, it's a game that's, if you've never played it, I think it's worth checking out, you know, like if you have like a, a PlayStation with an ODE in it or something. I, I wouldn't say anybody should go run out and buy it based on what I'm saying. But if you have a way to play ROMs or whatever, you should check it out. Viewpoint. Um, what do I want to say about? So I didn't. This is the first thing I'm going to say because it just popped into my head. And I didn't say it in the video. But uh, Joe from GameSack pointed this out to me that. Uh, viewpoint on the PlayStation is not in stereo, which I think is just really bizarre. Like, why would they do that? But um, so Viewpoint was, as I said in the video, Viewpoint was a Neo Geo game. Uh, it's, a, it's a game that I reasonably enjoyed playing. So as I fire up Viewpoint on my arcade cab, I don't have a Viewpoint cartridge, but um, it's on like the multi carts and whatnot. But uh, I mean, it's a fun game. It, I don't. I would prefer to play uh, the Neo Geo version for sure. The graphical overhaul or whatever on the PlayStation looks nice, and uh, the sound and the soundtrack's completely different. The soundtrack on the PlayStation is good, but I like the original soundtrack better. But uh, the game is a lot of fun either way. If you've never played Viewpoint, uh, you know you should. Like it's like this cool isometric. Uh, like rail shooter, I guess uh, you might call it. Um, you know, it's similar to Zaxxon, you know, but obviously Zaxxon is a very old game, so it's a lot more uh, rudimentary. And then uh, down there is Theme Park, and I don't... Like, Theme Park, I, I basically played enough Theme Park to get some gameplay footage. And, I mean, I remember that, like, when I originally wrote the script for that, it was so short that I was like, I, you know, I, I have to flesh this out a little bit. Like, I, I have to say at least a little bit more about it. But it's just like, you know, when I think of the PlayStation, I don't think of theme park. And when I think of theme park, I don't think of the PlayStation. And so I really felt like spending much of any time talking about the game just felt like a waste of time. So, so I didn't. Uh, Gunner's Heaven. Uh, this is not a game that came out here. I think I have played it a little bit just because I, I think I saw it in here and was just curious about it. And so I think I, I loaded it up on my, my PlayStation ODE. And um, this was a long time ago, so I don't really remember much about it. But uh, it's a lot like Gunstar Heroes, and they even say it right here in the text. Uh, this title, very similar in nature and execution to Gunstar Heroes in the Genesis. So... Uh, so there you go. But, uh, I just, I don't know if this is the kind of game that, that, you know, fell victim to the whole, uh, you know, we don't want 2d games on, uh, on the PlayStation. I don't know how true that whole thing is and how much of that is just sort of like an urban legend. But I mean, at this time, uh, you know, what's his face, Bernie Stoller was working for Sony and, you know, he was supposedly the guy that was all anti 2D. So maybe that's why the game didn't come out here. I don't know. And uh, then down here in the bottom is, of course, Resident Evil. And um, I remember when I when I learned how early of a release Resident Evil was, which I learned this very, very long time ago. But uh, I was surprised. Like, to me, Resident Evil feels more like a, a game that wouldn't have come out until, like, 1997. Like, the fact that it came out in early 96 just makes it, for me, like, even that much more impressive. So, um, I was never, like, the hugest Resident Evil fan on the PlayStation. But uh, my college roommate was, like, that was, like, his favorite game franchise or whatever. Like, he... Uh, 
he was super into like horror movies and whatnot. And, um, and so he, and he was into like all three of the resident evil games, uh, main games on, on the PlayStation. He, along with everybody else thought that resident evil survivor sucked. But, uh, for me, like resident evil four was when resident evil got, got good. I bought a GameCube. uh, just to play Resident Evil 4 when it came out. Uh, here's Battle Arena Toshinden, which, uh, you know, like I said, you know, when it came out, you know, obviously it was very popular. A lot of people bought it. But, you know, I think it was quickly overshadowed by other things. I mean, it's not a direct apples to apples comparison, but like I would much rather have uh, Virtua Fighter than Battle Arena Toshinden, but that would obviously back then just came down to whichever system you owned. Again, like I said, once Tekken came out, uh, again, it's not a direct apples to apples comparison, but you know, as far as just 3D fighters go, you know, you'd much rather, I think, have, uh, have Tekken. But that being said, Battle Arena Toshinden is really not a bad game uh, at all. It's not, it's not great, but it's good. And it was definitely a good launch game just because, you know, at the time, fighting games in general were still huge and 3D fighting games were becoming huge, really on the back of Virtua Fighter. Um, they gave it an 89. So, you know, obviously they liked it uh, quite not enough to put it into the 90s, but they liked it quite a bit. So, um, but, you know, it's got, you know, OK graphics, uh, you know, pretty decent soundtrack. Some of the sound effects are maybe not super great. I don't really feel like I'm in a position to like really evaluate it as a fighting game just because I'm really not a fighting game aficionado. Like somebody that knows more than I do would be able to say, you know, if it has like balance issues or something. So I'm not going to pretend like like I do. Mortal Kombat 3. Uh, so, you know, I'm on the record as not being the hugest Mortal Kombat fan, but I had fun playing this game uh, in recording gameplay footage for it. Uh, for the show, but, you know, I mentioned in the video that at the time it came out, you know, reviewers were sort of like lukewarm on it just because, you know, it, to a certain extent was just another Mortal Kombat game. You know, it was, I think at one point they, they said that it was going to be a 3d game and it ended up not being that it's really just more of a refinement, I would say of the Mortal Kombat series. Although again, I would say I'm not somebody that's like super knowledgeable with that kind of stuff. So, you know, somebody that was like a huge Mortal Kombat fan could say more than I could. But uh, you see, they gave it a 74. So I'm just saying they kind of also maybe felt like uh, the game was a little bit of a letdown. But I think if you go back and play it now, you know, I found the game to be quite playable. Uh, you know, the the fatalities are, are very violent, which is one of the things that, you know, you want in the Mortal Kombat game. I think I thought it was really funny the way you can like uppercut somebody and it sends them like through the ceiling and into a different level. I mean, that's not something that sells the game, but but uh, I thought it was pretty cool. But oh, I mean, overall, uh, and they mentioned it here. Mortal Kombat 3 is a great conversion of a slightly above average beat em up. Well, they call it a beat em up. But so, you know, like what they're saying, like the game is it's not arcade perfect, but it's, you know, pretty accurate to the arcade. But they're just saying that, you know, maybe it's not it's maybe a little bit uninspired uh, for the time as far as uh, fighting games go. But like he says here, uh, this is Zach Meston. Me, I'd buy a PlayStation because of Tashinden or Tekken, two fighting games that take the genre in new directions. So there you go. I guess people were getting maybe burned out on 2D fighters, which is interesting because, you know, in late 1995, there were still uh, a number of awesome 2D fighters that were yet to come out. PGA Tour 96. So it's funny because like this was a game that I was like really excited about, like, oh, I'm going to get to cover PGA Tour 96 when I do this video. But, you know, I kind of realized that like, yeah, I want to talk about PGA Tour 96, but the vast majority of people that are going to watch the video don't want to hear about PGA Tour 96. And so I really, um, you know, I try to be like cognizant of the fact that, you know, it, Somebody could be watching a video and at any time they can just be like, eh, that's enough and shut it off. 
And um, so, you know, there's one thing to be said for just like doing whatever you're passionate about. But at the same time, it's like, well, you have to kind of take the audience into consideration. So um, I tried to make the PGA Tour 96 uh, segment as short as I could. But um, I mean, it's a really like if you like the PGA Tour games on the Genesis, which I do, uh, I think PGA Tour 96 is uh, is awesome. And I don't think I mentioned this in the video, but kind of an interesting thing about it is, uh, you know, PGA Tour 96 also came out on the Genesis, but they tried too hard to make that version like this version, but the Genesis hardware really wasn't up to it. So that's actually the only entry in the PGA series on the Genesis that isn't good. Like there were, there were five PGA games from EA on the Genesis just one, two, three European tour and 96 and 96 ended up kind of sucking. But, um, if you like golf games, like I do, uh, this one is worth checking out. I forgot. I reviewed like all of the PGA games on the PlayStation for my website, like back before I started a YouTube channel. And, uh, I don't remember at what point it stopped being PGA tour and started being tiger woods. But um, like 96, 97, and I don't remember if there was a 98 or if that's when it went to Tiger Woods, but at least the first couple of them are really good. Like 96 and 97 are both really good. And you see they give it a 94. So, uh, you know, I think it just comes down to whether or not you like playing a golf video game or not. A hey, Destruction Derby. So this was another game that uh, I bought when I got... Uh, not right again, not right when I got my PlayStation, but like within probably the first six months, I would guess. Uh, I got my PlayStation in like early June, I think, of 97. And I think by the end of 1997, I had a pretty big library of PlayStation games. You know, I had a job. Uh, the PlayStation by then was a lot cheaper. And, you know, even like I am now, like I was a cheapskate with games. Like I loved buying games like after you know, they became greatest hits titles or if I could buy them used or whatever. And so I got Destruction Derby, but I think I only paid like 20 bucks for it. This was another game that we played, uh, you know, when Fabian came up here because we had so much fun playing this one, uh, uh, you know, back in the day, as it were. So it's a real shame. I think I said this in the video, but it's a real shame that, that this series didn't really continue. I mean, it did, but like, there's a there's a Destruction Derby 2 on the PlayStation. Uh, there's a Destruction Derby 64 on on the Nintendo 64, and, and there there's a couple others I think I don't remember. I like I listed them all off in the video, but um, really in my opinion, like the first one is the best one. And that, that's what I'm trying to say. It's a shame. Like you can imagine like the Destruction Derby game on a newer console, uh, and it would be pretty cool, but. Uh, they gave it, I don't remember if I said this already or not, they gave it a 93, which which I'm kind of happy to see that. And I wipe out. So I'm kind of surprised, like, I'm not surprised now. I was surprised while I was making the video. Like, there are a lot of reviews of Wipeout, I feel like, from back then, like contemporaneous reviews that were kind of like, yeah, this game's good, but not great. Like, I love Wipeout, and like, but like I said in the, in the, uh, in the video, if you play Wipeout with a standard digital controller, like, yeah, it's fine. You know, I could see where somebody would say, okay, well, it's got some control issues. But, man, if you play Wipeout with that Negicon controller, it's like a whole new game. And um, that's the only way I really ever played it. Um, I got into Wipeout. So my college roommate, the one that was all into to Resident Evil, he had this cousin that used to always come over and hang out. And that guy was just like all about Wipeout. Like he he was like Rain Man playing Wipeout. He was just like super, super good at it, but he would only play it with an NGCon controller. And so that's how I learned about the NGCon controller. And I ended up buying one on eBay from like Great Britain. Cause there, like, this was back when like, you know, there wasn't nearly as much stuff on eBay as there is now. This was in like 1998 or 1999. And um, he used to just play a ton of Wipeout XL with uh, with the Negicon controller. And I think I ended up buying Wipeout XL and Wipeout 3 to play, you know, because I had the Negicon controller. But um, 
I don't know. I, I love all the games. Like, you know, like some of them are better than others, obviously. Uh, I love the soundtrack, like sort of that. E it's funny. I called it an EDM soundtrack in the video. And then like somebody in the comments was like trying to argue with me. That's not EDM. Like, I don't whatever, dude. It's just like the soundtrack is like to me, it's like straight out of the mid 90s because that, you know, that's like around the time this is before. But, you know, it's like around the time that like the Matrix came out and like. EDM got more popular, like Big Beat got more popular, like, you know, Prodigy and Chemical Brothers and Propeller Heads and stuff like that. And so it's just like, what a 90s game uh, those wi early Wipeout games uh, are. And uh, I ended up buying whatever the latest Wipeout is on the PS4. I ended up buying that just so I could have some gameplay footage to show. Because uh, one of the things I enjoyed doing with that video is pointing out, uh, you know, well, here's a game where you know the franchise got started uh, in the very early days of the PlayStation, and the franchise is still going uh, today, um, like uh, like the Ace Combat series and and like Wipeout. Oh, speaking of of Ace Combat, um, so I I couldn't really find like what I felt like was a satisfactory explanation for why the first game was called air combat here and and the rest of them were called ace combat uh because in japan this first game is called ace combat and like i read somewhere that it had something to do with some kind of like copyright or trademark issue but it's one of those things where i couldn't you know, maybe i'm just stupid but like i couldn't find a good source that really explained what the issue was so uh so i don't know but the first air combat is like, I don't know, the game's like, okay. I feel like I used to have a higher opinion of the game. And then I played it more for that video and compared it to other things that were kind of out at the time. And it's it's not a direct like one-to-one -one comparison, but like, like I'd rather play Warhawk than the first air combat. But I mean, the game is still fun. Like I could have bought air combat for like full price in 1995 and I wouldn't have felt like I made a bad purchase. But, you know, I didn't have this game like back then. I got my first game in the series was uh, Ace Combat 2. And I sunk a lot of hours into Ace Combat 2. And I remember I wanted uh, Ace Combat 3 Electrosphere really badly. But like I was not willing to pay 50 bucks for it because uh, by then I had a PlayStation 2. And I don't know if anybody else like has this kind of mentality, but like once I get a newer system, I will not pay full price for games on like the older systems. Like when I had a Genesis when I was a kid, there was no way I was gonna pay 50 bucks for an NES game, or I wasn't even gonna ask for one for like my birthday or Christmas. Cause that's like wasting your, your gift request or whatever. Cause it's like, okay, that system's like old now. And so like, I kept waiting and waiting for a price drop on Ace Combat 3. And I finally got the game, but I don't remember. It might've been like way, way later. Um, like I remember, I don't know how many people really even know about this, but there used to be a PlayStation store in um, in this shopping center called the Metreon in San Francisco. Um, I think Sony owns the whole building. Like, you go in the building, there was like a really nice movie theater. There was an arcade. There was a Sony, isn't it called like Sony style store? Like they sold like Sony, like electronics. Like this, this camera is a Sony, this is the kind of thing you would have bought there. And then separately, there was a PlayStation store. And I only ever got to go there a couple times. I remember like that was the first place I ever saw Guitar Hero. They had like it set up so you could play it. And um, but I remember they had like a display on the counter where like where the cash wrap was of Ace Combat 3. And I really wanted it, but this was when I was in college and I didn't have a whole lot of money. And you know, it was it was $49.99. And I was like, I just can't do it. Like I can buy a playstation 2 game for that so so i never got it at the time but anyway that's a long story but just to say that uh, i didn't get the first air combat until actually it was only a couple years later i was still in college i found a long box copy of it at gamestop in like a bin full of like clearance games like it was in nice condition it's the copy i still have now it was a nice condition copy and it was like five bucks i was like all right i'll take that but you see they give it an 89 so i mean uh, they liked it, and I'm not saying I don't like it. 
Um, this is a really, really good game. Like I said, I could have bought the game for full price back then and been happy with it. I'm just saying I think there are other games that came out in 1995 that might scratch the same itch that I think might be a little bit better. Nova Storm. Um, I don't have a whole lot to say about Nova Storm. I didn't really enjoy it that much. It's a rail shooter. Um, I don't know. I mean, well, here you go. You want to see a bad score. They gave it a 33%. So uh, that's pretty bad. The reviewer says, unless you need to own every PlayStation game on the market, don't buy this game. And yeah, I would agree with that. Although I would say like... I could have rented this game for a weekend back then, and I think it would have been reasonably fun. Like, when the game first starts, I think it sucks, but, like, once you got your little ship uh, powered up a little bit, it wasn't so horrible. Uh, I think a 33% is maybe being a little bit heavy-handed, but, but it's definitely not a good game. Total Eclipse Turbo, uh, that's a launch game. Really kind of not super dissimilar to to uh nova storm although it's i mean it's better it's like somewhere in between like nova storm and warhawk uh, at least in terms of like the atmosphere and whatnot uh this was a a, a 3do game uh just called total eclipse i honestly have not played this game since i made that launch video which was like at this point many years ago but i just remember not really thinking much of it so Power Surf Tennis, um, I remember just hating this game. Uh, again, this was a launch game. And again, I haven't played this game since I made that launch video. I remember it just feeling hard to even score, like just get like one point. And uh, maybe if I had spent more time with it, I would have gotten a little bit more used to it. But overall, I just thought this game was really, really bad. Jumping Flash, on the other hand, here's another game, kind of like what I was saying about Warhawk. I feel like you don't ever hear anybody talking about Jumping Flash. And, like, this is such a great game. Like, I had so much fun. Like, I recorded so much more gameplay footage than I needed for this game because I just couldn't put it down. And um, I think I mentioned this game very, very briefly in the Nintendo 64 launch video because, you know, some people credit Jumping Flash as, like, the first console-based uh, 3D platforming game. So I think I talked about that like in the context of Mario 64. But I mean, just I love the colorful graphics of this game, but I, just the gameplay mechanics, like the way it plays, like the music. I could totally see somebody dismissing this as like a kiddie game, but it totally is not one. And uh, if you've never played Jumping Flash, you totally should. Like, I don't know if there's any way to play this on a newer console, like if the you know, if, if Sony sells it for, you know, like the PS3 or PS4 or whatever. But uh, even if not, you know, again, if you have a way of playing like uh, original PlayStation ISOs or whatever, like with the ODE or if you have a modded console or I mean, this the thing is, Jumping Flash has gotten to be kind of expensive. So it's like I'm not I'm certainly not telling anybody to run out and buy it, but it. If you can figure out a way to play it, you should. Or if not, I mean, shoot, just watch like a long play video or something. I think even that would be entertaining. But just a really, really good game. Ridge Racer, another launch title. Uh, this was a, probably one of the most embarrassing things for me that I ever said on the show as I, I made some, you know, statement about how like, and I don't even understand why I said this. I, I said something about like playing the game and about how if you were drifting, you were doing it wrong, which I don't understand why i would have said that because like the whole point of the ridge racer series is it's drifting so i don't i don't know it was just like a dumb it was a dumb thing to say like i said I, I was trying way too hard to have like attitude when i made that launch video i just think it's a terrible video but uh ridge racer is a good game it's not i don't think it's a great game just because like you know there's not it doesn't have like a bunch of tracks or or a bunch of different cars it has some uh, different cars. And if I remember correctly, it's just a few variations on the same track. Um, but it's still a lot of fun to play. And, um, I don't think this is that important of a feature, but based on the number of people that commented below that launch video, uh, some of whom kind of took umbrage with me for not mentioning this, you know, once you had the game loaded, you could open your PlayStation, take out the disc, put in the CD music CD of your choosing 
and have it play the music off of the CD uh, while you played the game. Not the kind of thing I'd be that excited to do, but uh, a lot of people obviously thought that it was based on the comments. And uh, they gave it a 92%. So I would say that, you know, uh, they liked it, but just overall, I mean, the the game is is well regarded in the series as a whole. Uh, I remember when was it Ridge Racer Type Four? It was called. I think that's what it's called. I remember when that came out. I was like really tempted uh, to buy it, just because it seemed more like it was made to compete with Gran Turismo. And by then, I was playing Gran Turismo uh, one or two. I don't remember which one was out uh, at the time, but I remember that Ridge Racer Type Four, at least at the store near me. They sold it like it was bundled with a controller, like not the Negicon. There was some other controller that Namco sold that had like a wheel. Like it looked like a normal controller, but it had a wheel. Was it called the JogCon? JogCon, I think. And it was like a it was like a little wheel that had a little indentation on it for your thumb, and you'd stick it in there, and you could you could steer that way, and it just it looked neat. But I never picked up the game because I just think I figured I'd, I'm probably not going to play this because I like Gran Turismo more. So, uh, oh, okay. So uh, I was waiting to talk about this one. Agile Warrior F111X. That's a typo. It's F111X, not F11X. Um, so I mentioned on Twitter. Oh, see, even it has the screenshot there. It says F111X. Uh, I mentioned on Twitter while I was making that video that there I didn't say what game I said there was a game that I had already written the script for the segment but then I went and played the game a bunch more to record more gameplay footage and based on that I had to completely rewrite the script and uh it's funny like a couple people I won't mention who a couple people like you know decided that they needed to like you know, light me up for like, how can you, you mean you didn't play the entire game and beat it before you, you wrote before you reviewed it. And it's funny. Cause it's like, I'm not reviewing the games, man. Like, I'm just like, basically like I'm saying like, here's this game. Uh, here are some other games that it's like, uh, here are what reviewers said about it at the time. And yeah, would I have bought it or would I have rented it back in the day? And like, that's about it. Like to me, it's like I'm showcasing games, but I'm not really giving my opinion about them that much. But like, if I think that a game's not very good or not very noteworthy, then it's going to be a short segment because it's like, I don't think I have much to say about this game because I don't think it's very good. So I'm just going to say that here's this game. It was a thing. Nobody liked it. Next, you know, and that's how I felt about Agile Warrior F111X because, like, most of the reviews of this game were really not very good, which is funny because you see uh, here they gave it a 96%. So uh, without reading this review, I, I don't know exactly why they gave it a 96%, but what I can say is clearly uh, these people kind of got it. You know, I wouldn't give the game that high of a score, but... You know, basically, I was playing it, and I was like, man, this is like a cheap imitation of... In fact, I think the line I had was that the game was a cheap amalgam of Air Combat and Warhawk. And uh, and that was pretty much, you know... Because the thing is, the most of the reviews that I saw in, like, you know, EGM Game Pro, whatever, game players, were kind of, like, backing that up. And so when I played it, I was like, yeah, that's pretty much what I think, too but then I needed more gameplay footage. And so I went back and played it and I, I just had like this aha moment with the game where I realized that like what the game is, is like Desert Strike in 3D. And that that's how you have to play the game. Like you can't play the game like you're playing like air combat or even like you're playing Warhawk. You have to play the game like, air, like, like Desert Strike it's just that it's in 3D. And once I realized that, I started playing the game differently and just sort of looking at the game differently. And I had so much fun with the game. I'm like, oh man, I get it now. And so then I had to, you know, rewrite the script and make it longer because I'm like, I want to make sure that anybody that watches this video understands that that's what this game really is and that you shouldn't listen. Anybody that gives it a bad review just doesn't know what they're talking about. So. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say about Agile Warrior F111X. Um, 
I don't know. Again, like if you have a way to play the game now, like I think it's totally worth checking it out. Uh, if you don't play the game, you, you know, it's not you're not missing a major life event. But I'm just really glad that that I had sort of that realization, uh, you know, before the video was finished. Um, Defcon Five, we already talked about. Not really a very cool ad. Uh, so this is like a magazine within a magazine. This um, Impact magazine. You know, it's kind of like maybe like the early days of like Mega Play or something, but. But the whole point of this is that it's like, uh, you know, import stuff. So, um, oh, and then over here, they just talk about, I guess, I don't, I don't know if there's any other games over here that I didn't mention that I wanted to mention. Um, yeah, maybe not. So, uh, but here's the sort of the cover story on this g magazine within a magazine, uh, Zero Divide. I mean, it was pretty cool. Uh, you know, I liked the fact that it had ring outs and I thought it was really cool that you could hang off the edge of the ring and then pull yourself back up. Um, it's okay. Like as far as 3D fighters go, uh, the game is uh, is very okay. Uh, they're already talking about uh, Battle Arena Toshinden 2 coming out. So I don't know if... Um, I don't think, oh yeah, okay, never mind. So this is down here. Look for Toshinden 2 in the arcades later this year. So these are just like preview screenshots. But uh, I, I'm not sure I've ever played Battle Arena Toshinden 2. So I don't know if I really even have anything uh, to say about it. What else we got? Uh, Zeitgeist. Oh, wait, no, I talked about this game, right? This Yeah, this game was in the video, wasn't it? But it got released here under a different name that now I can't remember. Shoot. Um... Yeah, I'm not gonna remember. I'm not gonna be able to remember. Um, I remember the game being kind of okay. I remember thinking the game had really cool, like very clean graphics. But uh, other than that, it was kind of like eh. Uh, Hermie Hopperhead. Yeah, I got nothing uh, with that one. Again, it's a 2D game. Did that come out here? I feel like it didn't, but I could be wrong. I feel like I've played this game at some point. I might have loaded this game onto my ODE at some point and just checked it out real quick. Uh, here's Zero Divide. Um, I mean, I thought it was cool that, like, you know, all of the characters seem like they were, like, well, not all of them are robots, but a bunch of them are, like, robots and whatnot. Like, that seemed like it was kind of cool. Um, there's just, like, a schedule of uh, games that are going to be coming out uh, soon or not so soon. Um, again, I'm just looking for anything that didn't already get talked about. That, that I want to talk about. Not really seeing. There's one other game I wanted to talk about. I'm still waiting to see if it happens to get mentioned in here. Boxer's Road. Uh, I don't I don't think this one came out here either. Again, I wouldn't swear to it. Really doesn't look very good. Uh, you know, to be honest, I've never been able to get into any boxing games that weren't part of the Punch-Out series. Like I've tried some other stuff on on different consoles, and uh, like you know, Evander Holyfield's Real Deal Boxing or whatever on the Genesis. Um, I can't remember. There, there was another game I tried to play on the on the NES. I couldn't get into. There was at least one boxing game on the on the PlayStation. I couldn't get into. Uh, I think I just I like boxing games as far as Punch Out goes, and and that's about it. Uh, and this is the last page. Uh, Shockwave Assault, which we already uh, talked about. That's at least kind of a cool ad. I kind of like that. They've got screenshots, but they're inside sort of these like travel sticker looking things. That's kind of neat. And then uh, NFL Quarterback Club 96 uh, on the back. I don't think I've ever played that game. So uh, that's it for uh, Volume 1, Issue 1 of Dimension PSX. The only other game I wanted to mention that I was hoping was going to be in there and isn't is Space Griffin VF9 because uh, that kind of falls into the same category as uh, 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 F111X, um, Agile Warrior F111X. I think it was the last game that I made the segment for on um, 
on that PlayStation in 1995 video because I was like dreading it. Like I played a little bit of it and I was like, oh, this game sucks. And uh, and so I didn't, I, you know, I was like procrastinating. I'm like, I'm going to do everything else first and then I'll finally do this stupid Space Griffin VF9 uh, segment that I that I hate. And I, the exact same thing happened that happened with Agile Warrior. Like, I'm like, all right. It was like one day I'm like, all right, let me sit down and play this this turd. And because um, it makes a real bad first impression, which same thing with Agile Warrior, bad first impression. Because, you know, you're in Space Griffin VF9, like you're in this gigantic mech and it's it's real slow and like the drawing is just terrible. But as soon as I started actually getting into the game, I had so much fun. Like, I think the way I thought about, I didn't say this, I don't think in the video, but the way I think of Space Griffin VF9 is it's like the perfect, like rainy day game. Like it's a rainy day and you can't go outside or you, maybe you stay home sick from work or something. Like that's the kind of game I could sit down on the couch, I think, and just play for like hours. Uh, I just thought it was a really fun game. And I'd say the same thing about Agile Warrior, both like very underappreciated uh, games. I don't remember what reviewers said at the time about Space Griffin VF9. I don't remember that game really getting a ton of coverage in the magazines, if I remember correctly. But um, really fun game. It's a game like I, after I played it, I was like, man, I, I kind of want to like own a copy of this game. You know, especially like I said, I got rid of a bunch of my uh, long box games, and so I was like, oh, I should buy a copy of Space Griffin VF9. Like, how much could that cost? And I looked it up, and it's kind of an expensive game. So, you know, I don't need it because I have an ODE, right? So, like, I'm fine. Like, I'm not going to buy that game. But uh, it was just the other one I could think of off the top of my head that uh, that I wanted to mention because I just thought it was a really cool game. So um, I think that's it. I think that's going to do it for, uh, for this episode. Hopefully that was at least somewhat enjoyable. Uh, you know, like I said, you know, normally with magazine read-throughs, I do some prep work so that I can speak a little bit more intelligently. But really, I was just trying to use the magazine as like a springboard to talk about, you know, the games that I that I played and talked about in uh, in that other video. So aside from the games in there that, you know, I'm not sure if they came out here at all or, or they didn't come out in 1995, I didn't really feel like I needed to do uh, quite as much prep work. So so there you go. So that's going to do it for this episode of CGQ+. Plus. As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.